Welcome to the third of the 2021 Randy L. and Melvin R. Family Lectures, Berlin Family Lectures, given in the Division of the Humanities at the University of Chicago. I'm Martha Feldman, a music historian in the Department of Music and the Program in Theater and Performance Studies. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome this year's speaker, the celebrated shape-shifting tenor, writer, and historian, Ian Bostridge. The overall rubric for these lectures is musical identities, and today's third and final Berlin lecture called Meditations on Death promises a tour through death's byways and portals via the great 20th century British composer, Benjamin Britten. Ian Bostridge has too many claims to fame to rehearse here. So allow me to say something personal instead. My most indelible memory of Ian came on October 20th, 2004, when I had the good fortune of watching him mesmerize an audience at Chicago Symphony Center in a performance of Schubert's Winterreise. I had never seen an entire being enter so completely into lead singing and yet this was not a theatrical performance, but a concert performance. There was a bottomless intensity to it and a vulnerability, even innocence. The sight of this impassioned romantic figure delivering himself of Winterweise with such immediacy made me rethink all I knew or thought I knew of Lied. I had heard the cycle many times before, but not with this combination of intimacy and concentration. It's become a shibboleth among voice scholars in the 21st century to newly prize the body in classical singing, to hear its labor of teeth, throat, breath, mucus, the grain, as my colleague Bertolt Hochner noted in his introduction to the first lecture. But Ian did not simply put the body back into voice. He also put the voice into the whole body. And in the process, he made himself into a kind of doppelganger to Schubert's protagonist, bringing us into his cold, lonely world. Since then, I've learned a lot about Ian's intellect and vocality from writings he's published in the last decade. In his 2015 book, Schubert's Winter Journey, Anatomy of an Obsession, a rich and delightfully uh, idiosyncratic work uh, he wanders like its subject across fields that take the reader into unexpected gullies and eddies through literature, psychology, dance and art, singers and movies, and histories, personal, social, and political. His writery, writerly collection, A Singer's Notebook of 2011, conjures other delights and other insights and conjure is perhaps the right word uh, since Ian's first book was after all called Witchcraft and Its Transformations. A singer's notebook tells us, for instance, about filling downtime on the road while fighting off the, in quotes, neurosis inducing physical requirements of the unamplified voice, end quote, uh, by watching the TV show, The Sopranos. Now you might presume from that that he was watching a show about high voice singers and hilariously, Ian confesses uh, to something of the same. But then the Sopranos ends up being a way to prepare himself for singing the role of the eponymous protagonist in another family drama, Mozart's King Idomeneo, the patriarch who is doomed to sacrifice his own son on returning from the Trojan Wars. And the intertwining of the two dramas provides the ground for a canny analysis of both. Elsewhere in a singer's notebook, we get more purchase on the method and even madness of Ian's musical process and the intensity that he brings to it. In quotes, every sung performance has that quality of the best stand-up comedy, of teetering on the edge, of daring to be almost but not quite ridiculous, end quote. It's that daring, I think, that has enabled Ian to transform lead singing the world over and to fascinate us with his writings on both the craft and the objects of singing. 
We're immensely fortunate to be able to hear from him today. Please join me in welcoming Ian Bostrich for his final Berlin family lecture, Meditations on Death. In this final lecture, I want to look at classical music's engagement with finality, with death, and to focus in on one of the composers in this tradition who repeatedly returned explicitly to death as a theme, Benjamin Britten. His meditations on death in music are some of the most profound that we have, at the same time troubling and consoling. Death is not only the ultimate dissolution of identity, as all the physical, psychological, and social ligatures that tether it in place are severed, it is also that in the face of which we make our identity. These fragments have I shored against my ruin, as T.S. Eliot put it. Habits, interests, love, the hourly, the daily, and all the busyness of life. It was the philosopher Bernard Williams who argued in a famous essay on Janáček's opera, The Macropolis Case, about a woman gifted or rather cursed with immortality, that life only makes sense in the face of its finitude. We are lucky in having the chance to die, Williams concluded. This does not require that death itself is desirable. Death can destroy meaning while at the same time the prospect of mortality creates that very meaning that death destroys. That at least is one reading of Williams's long and complex argument. It is somehow appropriate that Williams's discussion centers around an opera, the Macropolis case. This is not just because Janáček's opera is about the daughter of a court physician in the 16th century who, having taken an elixir of life, is now 342 years old and in a state of boredom, indifference and coldness, as she puts it. It's also because it is a piece of complex and discursive music. Music is expressive without being denotative. It is material and precise, but at the same time metaphysically suggestive, the closest thing this side of revelation to a glimpse of the divine. It is in music that this paradox of Williams's can be contained and engaged with. That which creates meaning also destroys it. Music helps us to deal with death, with its inevitability, its incomprehensibility, its necessity. In certain pieces of music, we face death within a world of sounds which is resolutely alive at the same time as it is transitory, fleeting, always decaying, as sound does. Music has, in Shakespeare's famous words, a dying fall. <clears throat> Silence is surely the ultimate symbol of death in terms of sound. But until we die, as Jacques Derrida had it, there will be sounds. Utter soundlessness, true silence, is not available to the living subject. Gestures towards silence, however, are part of our cultural encounter while we remain alive with the nothingness of death, our own horror vacui, or that sense of emptiness and loss that we feel in the face of the death of others. This relative silence, this imagined silence, can be an evocation of things which are inexpressible. There is that organized and audible silence with which many societies mourn their dead. The silence at a funeral, the two minute silence observed in memory of the war dead in the United Kingdom and elsewhere ever since the end of the First World War. Both of these silences encourage us to think of the departed, to memorialize them, but they also necessarily and inevitably involve thinking about our own mortality. They bind together the living and the dead in a contemplation of a common end. <coughs> Silence is essential to music. The rests as important as the notes. But beyond that, 
there are significant silences which gesture towards nothingness in classical music. I think especially of a song in Schubert's great cycle for voice and piano, Winterreiser, Winter Journey, 24 songs, written in 1827, 1828. This work was composed in the face of impending death. Schubert had contracted syphilis in 1823, and although his death in 1828 came early and unexpected, possibly from typhus, he spent the last five years of his life under the shadow of an early demise, producing works in this last 18 months, which seemed to speak to a sense of mortality. Winterizer is a journey into the snow, white blankness, a journey away from a failed love affair in which the journeyer looks deeply into himself and, plumbing the depths of loneliness and isolation, of metaphysical despair, learns a lesson which Samuel Beckett, who loved the cycle, took up in the 20th century. You must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on, is how his novel, The Unnameable, ends. In the 14th song of Winterreiser, Der Greiser Kopf, The Old Man's Head, the wanderer discovers that the frost has turned his hair white. While the music in the piano expresses a sort of horror at this transformation with a leap of an augmented fourth, that unholy interval which late medieval musicians christened the diabolus in musica, the devil in music. While the music in the piano does that, the wanderer, the singer, reacts with an expression of grim satisfaction. One step closer to the end of his journey, the journey we all take towards death. Then the frost melts and our hero is a young man again. How far still to the grave? Wie weit noch bis zur Bahre? he asks. Schubert's repetition of this question at a lower pitch, barely harmonized, is followed by a pause, which, when I perform the cycle, always seems to demand a longer than usual duration, an extended, unnatural, almost unmusical silence in which Schubert, the musicians, and the audience look into the abyss. And if we want to understand this biographically, which is to say to understand it as the expression of a suffering human being, Franz Schubert, rather than a creator genius, it's as if Schubert is repeating the phrase not to underline our distance from dissolution, but to grasp its inevitability and to contemplate our own mortality. Silence points deathwards here. Schubert had a particular gift for what we might call deathly music, even before his illness. One of his earliest songs, never completed, is called Leichen Fantasie, Corpse Fantasy. One of his greatest, setting an equally great poem by Goethe, is a paradoxical evocation of stillness through a particular sort of quiet music. Over every mountaintop is quiet, In each and every treetop, you can hardly feel a breath. The birds are silent in the woods. Soon you too will be quiet. This is Schubert's second Wanderers Nachtlied. (laughs) 
The instrumental music which Schubert wrote in the last years of his life is not all drenched in contemplation of mortality. There's a lot of dance music for piano, for example, an excellent distraction from morbid thoughts. But many of the late works, while anything but morbid, seem to speak to the listener as intimations and explorations of the evanescence of human life and the ever-present defining limit, which is death. Here is George Steiner in his book, Real Presences, struggling to express these ideas, which are so hard to get a handle on. What we can say, a saying both exceeding and falling short of responsible knowledge, is that there is music which conveys both the grave constancy, the finality of death, and a certain refusal of that very finality. This dual motion, instinctual to humanity but scandalous to reason, is evident. It is made transparent to spiritual, intellectual and physical notice in Schubert's C major quintet. Listen to the slow movement. Do, we don't have time now, but do go and listen to it later. There are other famous pieces of abstract classical music, large scale and small scale, symphonic and chamber works, which work on us in this way. At the outer edge of vastness are Mahler's symphonies. Leon Buchstein explains how the composer turns symphonic form into the journey of life, one which can embrace the finality of death and its refusal, which Steiner talks about in relation to Schubert's quintet. Mahler's symphonies, Botstein writes, can be construed as placing the listener in the role of pro a protagonist within the work. The listener has the sense of direct confrontation with a musical mirror of the chaos and ambiguities of the external world and subjectivity. <clears throat> Benjamin Britten was a composer who grappled throughout his career with the horror and inevitability of death in music of transcendent power. He put death very publicly at the center of his output from early on in his career as a composer. His first symphony was entitled Symphonia da Requiem. In 1939, a few weeks after the outbreak of the Second World War, he received an unusual commission <clears throat> from the Japanese government. He was asked to compose a symphony to celebrate the 2600th anniversary of the founding of the Mikado dynasty. Britain, a known pacifist, was an odd choice for the militaristic Japanese regime, but Britain, he doubled down. I'm making it as anti-war as possible, he told a New York newspaper in April 1940. His friend, the composer Lennox Barclay, found the choice of Britain for a commission from a, nature, from a nation which was currently executing a vicious war in China, a piece of disconcerting irony. The work that resulted was the Symphonia da Requiem. Not only was it publicly trailed as an anti-war piece, it, it was also structured in three parts, each given the title from the Ro Roman Catholic Mass for the Dead. In the end, perhaps inevitably, the Japanese government withdrew the commission. Mr. Benjamin Britten's composition is so very different from the anticipation of the committee, they wrote. What did Britten intend in the first place? Was the Symphonia, as Britten's latest biographer, Paul Kilday suggests, a sort of Trojan horse, an anti-war piece smuggled into, or meant to be smuggled into, the Japanese celebrations? This seems unlikely given Britain's unguarded public remarks about the piece. He was certainly annoyed to have had the commission withdrawn, and it seems therefore that he didn't expect that to happen. His political bravado was something he expected, perhaps foolishly, to get away with. He could have presented the piece to the Japanese without controversial public comment, but ultimately a piece structured as a requiem offered to celebrate the immortality of a divine and ancient dynasty was a disconcerting choice. <clears throat> Dedicated to his deceased parents, 
the Symphonia de Requiem, as it finally appeared, is structured in three movements, each imagined as a section from the ancient Requiem Mass for the Dead. A lacrimosa, lamenting, a dies irae, fearful, nervous, a requiem eternam, pleading for eternal rest. As a piece of abstract music, often Marlerian in quality, it escapes from Britain's political agenda and retains the metaphorical freedom which allows it to be at one and the same time a protest at the slaughter of war, a musical manifesto for peace, and a personal reckoning with mortality in the tradition of the great requiems of the past, Mozart, Verdi, Fauré. The dedication to his late parents is a measure of the work's intensely personal core. <coughs> Britain spent the early years of the war in the United States, where he wrote the Symphonia da Requiem, but he returned to England in 1942, braving the dangerous wartime Atlantic crossing. He flung himself into writing some of his greatest pieces, including his opera, Peter Grimes, and giving concerts as part of his war work as a registered conscientious objector. He was working now almost exclusively with words. There was Grimes, the opera, his song cycle in Italian, the Michelangelo sonnets, his anthology of English verse, the serenade for tenor, horn and strings, which in its keening and creepy fourth song, the lightweight dirge, confronts death head on. Britain developed a new and muscular approach to the setting of English poetry, earnest for intelligibility, but also unafraid of melisma, returning to the inspiration of England's greatest composer of the 17th century, Henry Purcell. In July 1945, the war in Europe, recently over, Britain was invited to a party hosted by his English publisher, Boozy and Hawkes. There, he met the Nepalus Ultra of violinists, Yehudi Menuhin. Menuhin had offered his services to a Jewish group which was working together with the United Nations and planning to travel to war-ravaged Germany with the pianist Gerald Moore to play together for survivors of the Bergen-Belsen camp in Lower Saxony and for German civilians in the surrounding area, the saddest ruins of the Third Reich, as Menuhin later put it. As Menuhin remembered, it was just a week before I was going to go to Germany to play for the displaced persons at the camps. Ben desperately wanted to go at all costs, and indeed, Ben came with us. Britain replaced Gerald Moore as Menuhin's accompanist. This was to be Britain's last job as a conscientious objector, affiliated to what was known as ENSA, the Entertainment's National Service Association. The interaction of this trip with his conscience can only have been a complex one, since he had refused to fight. Two, and sometimes three concerts a day were presented, Britain wrote, to listeners in some of them appalling states who could scarcely sit still and listen and yet were thrilled to be played for. Men and women alike, our audience was dressed in army blankets fashioned by clever tailors among them into skirts and suits. No doubt a few weeks since their rescue they'd put a little flesh on their bones, but to our unaccustomed eyes they seemed desperately haggard and many were still in hospital. The cellist Anita Laska-Walfisch, a Holocaust survivor, was present at these concerts and wrote about them much later. Concerning the accompanist, I can only say that I just cannot imagine anything more beautiful or wonderful. Somehow one never noticed that there was any accompanying going on at all, and yet I had to stare at this man like one transfixed as he sat seemingly suspended between chair and keyboard playing so beautifully. Pressed in the 1960s to describe how this experience in Germany in 1945 had been, Britain could only say, we gave two or three short recitals a day. They couldn't take any more. It was in many ways a terrifying experience. After his partner's death, the tenor, Peter Piers, said that the experience had colored everything he had written subsequently. On his return to London, 
Britain plunged headlong and feverishly, quite literally, as he was suffering from the after effects of a typhoid inoculation, into the composition of one of his greatest song cycles, the Holy Sonnets of John Donne, in which death is at the forefront. His previous cycle for voice and piano, the Seven Sonnets of Michelangelo, had been an extraordinarily brave and explicit declaration of love for his partner and the first singer of the cycle, Peter Piers, even if it had been a declaration of sexuality concealed behind the Renaissance complexities of Michelangelo's poetic language. In choosing to set the poetry of Donne, Britain was turning from the 16th to the 17th century, from mannered Italian to metaphysical English, from love to a confrontation with death, with sin, with guilt. The cycle was completed on the 19th of August, 10 days after the second atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. It was performed by Britain and Piers at the Wigmore Hall on the 22nd of November. Britain's familiarity with Dunn's verse, encouraged by his one-time friend W.H. Auden, predates his setting of the sonnets. In 1941, he made an incomplete sketch for voice and piano of Dunn's love song, Stay, O Sweet, and Do Not Rise. And in 1943, Piers recounted that, quotes, Ben and I have been rereading Dunn lately, those wonderful holy sonnets, and especially the hymn to God the Father, a poem which Britain returned to towards the end of his life, providing a realisation for the 17th century setting of the poem by Pelham Humphrey. Let's turn now to look at John Donne's own poetic reckoning with mortality. The poet John Donne's relationship with death was an unusually complex, anxious and obsessive one, full of contradiction. His views were not always orthodox according to the values of his time. In 1608, he wrote the first treatise justifying suicide in English, a shocking act of heterodoxy published after his death, implying that Jesus Christ himself had committed suicide. Yet by 1615, he had started on a stellar career as a minister in the Church of England, committed to orthodoxy and rising to become Dean of St Paul's Cathedral. His confrontations with the inevitability of extinction have an intense psychological character. A few weeks before his death, a portrait was made of him clothed in his own shroud. And he was famous for having delivered his own funeral sermon not long before his death, poised as he was on the lips of that whirlpool, the grave, in Lent 1630. It was published not long after as Death's Duel. In the hymn to God the Father, that poem of Dunn's that, Pear, uh, that Piers and Britain particularly loved, Dunn berates himself for his many sins, ending crucially with a sin of fear that when I have spun my last thread, I shall perish on the shore. A fear that death is indeed the end of everything and that the crossing over from earth to eternity is nothing but an illusion. This was for Dunn an admission of sin, of an unorthodox questioning of the doctrine of the afterlife. But it also powerfully expressed his personal and visceral resistance to nothingness, to extinction, the sense that these would be worse even than the horrors of damnation. The holy sonnets, both Duns and Britons, are anything but quiet and resigned. They are noisy, terrified, terrifying. As the critic John Carey has noted, the prospect of annihilation was highly antipathetic to Dunn. His aim, when he writes about death, is to make it more active and positive than life, and so negate its deathliness. But that underlying and basic fear of extinction is harnessed to the orthodox Protestant fear of eternal damnation as the wages of sin, the theme which runs through most of Dunn's 19 holy sonnets. And while a sort of uh, 
panic-ridden energy courses through much of Dunn's extraordinary and extravagant language, it is an energy contained within the form of the sonnet, hitherto used almost exclusively for the poetry of love. Among the nine sonnets Britain chooses to set to music are some of Dunn's most anguished poems. Thou hast made me, and shall thy work decay. Repair me now, for now mine end doth haste. I run to death, and death seeks me as fast, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. I dare not move my dim eyes anyway. Despair behind, and death before doth cast such terror, and my feebled flesh doth waste by sin in it which it towards hell doth weigh. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look, I rise again. But our old subtle foe so tempteth me that not one hour I can myself sustain. Thy grace may wing me to prevent his art, and thou like adamant draw mine iron heart. Here's Britain's setting of that poem. Thou hast made me, and shall thy work decay. Repair me now, for now mine ends doth haste. I run to death, and death seeks me as fast. And all my Anyway, despair behind the dead before the cast such terror, and my fever flesh doth waste my seed in it, which it holds hell doth weigh. Only thou art above, and when towards thee by thy leave I can look, I rise again. But our old subtle foe so tempted me that not one hour myself I can sustain. Thy grace may win me to prevent his art, and thou like adamant draw mine iron heart. The fear that Dunn summons up here, I run to death, and death seeks me as fast, is brilliantly conveyed by Britain, as the fingers of the pianist seem to chase each other across the keyboard in a moto perpetuo dance of death. The voice states its challenge to its maker, thou hast made me and shall thy work decay, and then participates in the scurrying terror which the piano has set up. As the poem briefly looks upwards towards, upwards towards God, the voice and piano are suspended in an ethereal upper register, but the song ends with a coda in the piano of surpassing brutality, chords which seem to want to crush thought. There is something visceral about this song, the sense of a personal and overwhelming fear of death, regardless of the theological niceties of the poem itself with its offer of redeeming grace. The songs as a whole are a juxtaposition and alternation of intense keening, energy, violence, and fear. In the center, emotionally, if not literally, is a calm oasis. The sonnet Dunn wrote on the death of his wife in 1617, since she whom I loved, which Britain sets with an aching rhythm, two in the voice against three in the piano, difficult in practice to sustain at such a slow tempo, and which seems to embody the yearning of loss. Private and public are continually interwoven in this cycle. Britain's feverishness in the summer of 1945, which seems to inform much of the character of the cycle, is announced at the outset, as the poet is summoned by sickness, death's herald and champion, and it returns with the fantastic ague of the fourth song, O To Vex Me. On the public plane, there is talk of tyrannies, dearth, prison, execution, war, 
words which would have had a particular resonance for an audience in 1945, and for a man, the composer, who had been witness to the consequences of the darkest horrors of the Nazi regime. There is a sustained interplay in the songs between notions of sin, repentance, grace, pardon, and forgiveness, which straddle the realms of the personal and the societal in the wake of war and of extermination. It's difficult to hear the words of Song 5, what if this present were the world's last night, without thinking of the horrific destructiveness of war and of the recent obliterations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <coughs> the last song of the Holy Sonnet is perhaps the most famous poem of the set, Death Be Not Proud. For the critic John Carey, Part of the strength of this poem is that its argument is so weak. Its ill-assorted reasons tumble out in no recognizable order, reflecting in a disarray. Dunn's sonnet form tames this disorder. And while Britain's set settings of Dunn often disrupt or obscure the metrical design of the verse, the music he composes for this song in a similar way to the sonnet form holds the disarray at an emotional distance. Compared to the other songs of the cycle, this one pulsates with an ominous calmness. The music Britain composes for this song is a passacaglia with a five bar ground bass, essentially variations over an ostinato pattern, a repeated pattern, which creates a sense of timelessness. It's stately, assured, calm, even the references to fate, chance, kings, desperate men, poison, war, and sickness, to all of whom death is a slave, have a sort of detached grandeur. As so often in the song repertoire, formal analysis of the music tells us one thing, performance another, because the words and the music exist in tension with one another. Britain does not set the word to, words to music, but offers a commentary on them, which in its detachment only intensifies the inadequacy of this catalogue of challenges to death's dominion. When those famous final words ring out, sustained in self-contradictory defiance, death, thou shalt die, they ring hollow. <clears throat> The whole cycle opens with hammered octaves in the piano and the words, Oh my black soul. Dunn's holy sonnets are an expression of the paradoxes and tensions which are created in a mind psychologically and poetically alive to death. They are poems which are, as John Carey notes, the product of a powerful ego which cannot accept the inevitability of its own demise. Britain crafts from them something which certainly engages with that self-centred anxiety, but intended to be performed in public and to be performed by two men who were deep colleagues and devoted lovers, it already moves on a different plane. That central song, not arithmetically but emotionally, since she whom I loved, the song on the death of Dunn's wife, has words which tell, despite Dunn's grief, of the poet's continued focus on the issue of his own redemption. Why should I beg more love from God, he writes, punning on his wife's surname. She was born Anne Moore. Why should I beg more love? And her role in the sonnet is to lead him towards God and redemption. Britain's music pushes it very much in another direction, filling it with a tremendous warmth of generous love, which reminds us of the equally still 
and rapturous third song of his Michelangelo sonnets, an unabashed love song. It's striking that as well as dedicating the Dunn cycle to peers, that the image Britain chose for the cover of the published cycle was El Greco's St. Peter, an allusion to Peter Pears, surely. More importantly, the cycle as a whole, drenched as it is in sin and death, can only have spoken to its audience as a meditation and reckoning with the deathly horrors of six years of total war. This is, I want to say, something Britain finds again and again in his music, an elision of the public and the private vision of death, a visceral grappling with its personal meaning, but also with its public context. At the same time, what lies buried at the heart of Britain's cycle to be experienced by any voice and piano duo who perform it and then transmit it to the audience is a rare and frightening experience of guilt, the complex guilt Britain must have felt as a non-combatant after witnessing Bergen-Belsen post-liberation and of justified rage as a pacifist seeing evidence of the horrendous destructiveness of modern warfare in the area around it. This inevitable tension feeds the cycle. It makes it all the more striking that in the great public work he wrote to mourn and commemorate the Second World War, his War Requiem of 1962, neither Nazi extermination nor the war from the air were directly addressed. Britain's holy sonnets have an epilogue, a complete draft in pencil, setting a piece of prose by Dunn, the 17th meditation from the devotions upon emergent occasions with its supremely famous phrase, immortalized by Ernest Hemingway, for whom the bell tolls. It was struck out in Britain's manuscript and never published or apparently sung until it was rediscovered long after the composer's death. Here is that famous text of Dunn's from the devotions that Britain set. Perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth, and though it intimate again, yet from that minute that this occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings, but who can remove it from that bell which is passing a piece of himself out of this world? No man is an island entire of himself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends of thine, or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Britain's setting of this is particularly striking because as a setting for the voice, it's barely a setting at all. The piano starts the piece with octave F sharps repeated three times, sempre mezzo piano. These repeated notes continue throughout the piece as the voice enters on this, that same note, F sharp, freely intoning, chanting, speaking the text, quasi parlando, all on F sharp, with the piano adding a largely chordal accompaniment. The mezzo piano F sharps in the piano continue relentlessly through the piece. This repeated motif is clearly the tolling bell of Dunn's meditation, insistent and admonitory. It encodes the social and the personal, for while the meditation is a reminder that we are all connected, that we are all parts of each other, that any death diminishes us, it also encapsulates that recognition that is associated with any act of mourning another at a funeral, the two minutes silence. That recognition that this is our 
common destination. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, the public and the private intertwined, the social and the personal. This epilogue is a typically brilliant structural compositional manoeuvre by Britain because in the tolling bells of the epilogue, the hammering fierce octaves at the outset of the piece, which we heard, the first sonnet, O, o My Black Soul, are retrospectively revealed to be bells too, if singularly ferocious ones. These are bells which in this opening sonnet, O My Black Soul, are the summons of sickness, death's herald and champion. And in the meditation with which Britain originally made to close his cycle, Dunn is confined to bed with a dangerous fever. That's how he came to write the meditation. And it is the noise of the passing bell tolling to mark the dying of a neighbour which elicits his attention and his reflections. Like Dunn, Britain too, as we know, had been confined to bed with a fever while writing. So there's a real similarity between their situations at this point, their personal situations. So this muted setting of the meditation weaves together Britain's personal state and a public declaration of solidarity with the suffering of liberated Europe. We can only speculate as to why he excised it. It may be simply that the epilogue is too explicit in its connection of the preceding cycle with Britain's condition and the condition of Europe. There's perhaps an awkwardness there, uh, an embarrassment or discomfort expressed in Britain's refusal to talk much about what he had experienced in Germany in 1945. The terror and compassion, the guilt and the fury of the holy sonnets of John Donne in their final form stand alone without explanation to circulate in the realm of the metaphorical, which doesn't stop us speculating on their origins. Those passing bells, which called to Dunn on his sickbed, return in Britain's greatest public work of mourning, his War Requiem, composed for the reconsecration of the bombed out Coventry Cathedral in 1962. Already before the commission, Britain had been talking about his plans for a mass, a rather sad 20th century European affair. So the call from Coventry in October 1958 was perfectly timed. He was writing the piece for himself and for the world at large. The whole piece embodies a dialogue between the private and the public as it alternates between a large-scale and musically allusive setting of the Requiem Mass for soprano soloist, double choir, and symphony orchestra. It's a huge musical apparatus with a Requiem Eternam, Dies Irae, Offertorium, Sanctus, Agnus Dei, and Libera Mei. These movements are broken up by settings of war poems by Wilfred Owen for baritone, tenor and chamber orchestra, written in Britain's most personal and hermetic style. The whole mass starts with tolling bells. F sharp, a subliminal echo of the Dunn cycle, and then C, F sharp C, a tritone, the notorious diabolus in musica, or devil in music. Something is not quite right. The first of the Owen settings is his anthem for doomed youth. It starts, what passing bells for these who die as cattle. Britain's choice of the First World War poet Wilfred Owen was a singularly brilliant one. Of all the war poets, it was Owen who was able to modulate the tropes and linguistic idiosyncrasies of the English religious tradition. This in turn allows his, poet, his poetry to stand in ironic counterpoint to the text of the Latin Requiem Mass. Hence, those tolling bells opening the piece, 
are matched by the passing bells of Anthem for Doomed Youth, which, as the poem reveals, are no bells indeed, but only the monstrous anger of the guns or the rifles' rapid rattle. The tuba mirum spargens sonum, trumpet pouring forth its awful sound of the dies irae, disperses into the chamber music setting of bugles saddening the evening air, which comes from Britain's, uh, which comes from Owen's unfinished poem, but I was looking at the permanent stars. The grandeur, or is it perhaps bluster, of Rex Tremende Majestatis, King of Fearful Majesty, from the Latin Requiem, tumbles into the music hall knockabout of Britain's setting of Owen's The Next War. Out there we've walked quite, quite friendly up to death, in which two soldierly comrades, tenor and baritone, laugh at death, their old chum, as they call him. Mention of God's promise to Abraham and his seed, the promise of eternal life, in the Requiem movement, the Offertorium, is matched by Owen's refashioning of the Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac. Britain had already set a medieval mystery play version of Abraham and Isaac in his Canticle II for tenor, alto, and piano. It's a familiar tale, if a perplexing one. God asks Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, but at the last minute, happy with Abraham's obedience, relents. Britain reuses some of the music from the earlier piece, Abraham and Isaac, in this setting. But Owen's punchline is a grim and devastatingly ironic one. The old man, Abraham, refuses to accept God's last-minute offer of mercy and, to quote, slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one. Britain's war requiem, despite all these devastating ironies of juxtaposition, is not a simple act of anti-establishment pacifism. It's full of the paradoxes which all great works of art contain, and Britain's own remarks about it are hedged around with contradiction. Here was a composer for whom the music was what mattered, something upon which he insisted, but a composer who also declared to friends that what counted as far as the Requiem was concerned was its message and nothing else. Can he really have meant that? What is its message in that sense? War is bad? Governments that fight wars are hypocrites? Doubtless true, but reducing the Requiem to such simple nostrums eviscerates its ambiguous power. Here is a piece commissioned to commemorate the destruction of Coventry Cathedral in the Second World War, which is grounded in the sounds and experiences of trench warfare in the First World War. Genocide and aerial bombardment are avoided, though Britain did later in his life write perhaps the most devastating response to the war from the air, his setting of William Sutar's The Children for voice and piano. The blood of children stares from the broken stone. And through all this, it has to be remembered that Owen himself was not a pacifist and fought on in the war to be killed just a week before the armistice in November 1918. In his copy of Edmund Blunden's 1931 memoir, a preface to a collection of Owen's poems, Britain highlighted this passage, which Owen himself wrote. I think it's from a letter. Already I have comprehended a light which never will filter into the dogma of any national church, namely that one of Christ's essential commands was passivity at, all, at any price, suffer dishonour and disgrace, but never resort to arms, be bullied, be outraged, be killed, but do not kill. It may be a chimerical and an ignominious principle, but there it is. It can only be ignored 
And I think pulpit professionals are ignoring it very skillfully and successfully indeed. And am I not myself a conscientious objector with a very seared conscience? This seems to be a most apt, apt summary from Owen of the tension powering so much of Britain's work, a conscientious objector with a very seared conscience. Owen's conscience seared because he fought and killed, Britain's because he did not. Britain's War Re Requiem is a piece with which I feel a very strong connection. I performed it first as part of an act of remembrance in 1994, before I was even a professional singer, in Guildford, England, and Freiburg, Germany, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Freiburg in November 1944. Since then, up until the current pandemic put a temporary stop to performances of large-scale works like the Requiem, I had performed it some 84 times, three times in 2002 in Chicago with the Chicago Symphony under Mr. Slav Rostopovich, husband of Galina Vishnevskaya, for whom the soprano part was originally written. So I've sat through the piece in concert and rehearsal many, many times. It's difficult, of course, to sum up a reaction to such a piece in mere words, but my feeling each time, apart from the indestructible nature of the Requiem, its quality of sustained intensity and ability to move and engage performers, orchestra and audience, my feeling every time is that this enormous and impressive structure, this very public piece, nevertheless nurses at its core the same private and personal preoccupations which animate a piece like the Holy Sonnets. The, the War Requiem is a commemorative piece, but its mourning for the lost dead is only amplified by the sadness and terror about the transience of human life and that guilt at our inevitable complicity in suffering, which it reiterates at each performance. The personal and the interpersonal relentlessly and expressively intertwined. <clears throat> All the music that Benjamin Britten wrote was meant for public performance, of course. It could be more or less public in feeling and aesthetic, more or less intimate in style or scoring, more or less encoded with private thoughts, fears, tensions, guilts, or embarrassments. The war requiem is full of such secrets, no doubt, more or less buried, but it was surely the most public piece Britain ever wrote. The nature of the commission, the degree of public scrutiny, the large sales of the LP box set of the work produced shortly after its first performances made the war requiem unique as a post-war work of classical music. It was acclaimed almost universally as a masterpiece, while a few critics remained sniffy about the sheer degree of the brouhaha and publicity. Some of them are still a bit sniffy about the piece. It's too popular. Stravinsky, the greatest living composer himself, complained with a pun about the Battle of Britain atmosphere and made withering comments about how audience members should be sure to bring a box of Kleenex with them. Britain himself was made uncomfortable by the public success of the War Requiem, and it brought an end to a certain period in his life as a public figure. He didn't compose any of his subsequent significant works in this publicly accessible manner. His musical style became more spiky, more modern. The church parables which followed through the decade, including Curlew River, were challengingly offbeat and idiosyncratic. He wrote some intimate chamber music, including cello sonatas for Rostropovich, and a television opera, Owen Wingrave, which has rather languished from neglect. The one really big piece he wrote was his last opera, Death in Venice, 1973, based on the novella by Thomas Mann. The story is a well-known one. The celebrated Gustav von Aschenbach, 
a writer, is suffering from creative block. Taking a walk in his hometown, Munich, he enters a cemetery where he encounters a mysterious traveller whose appearance somehow inspires him to travel to the south to break his imaginative logjam. Uh, log he journeys to Venice, and while there becomes increasingly drawn to a young Polish boy, Tadjo, who is staying in the same hotel on the Venetian Lido. A cholera outbreak reaches Venice, and Aschenbach fails to warn Tadjo's family of the danger, while at the same time delaying his own departure. Finally, Tadjo's family make arrangements to leave. Aschenbach dies from the cholera, from a heart attack, from artistic exhaustion, as he watches Tadjo on the beach, fighting with another bar boy, and then walking out to sea. Biographical criticism has its dangers, but remains endlessly tempting, and as far as I'm concerned as a singer, often productive in coming to terms with the works which I seek to bring to life. The autobiographical quality of both Thomas Mann and Benjamin Britten's engagement with Aschenbach's story has long been noted. Almost all of the events that happened, happened to Aschenbach on his way to Venice and in Venice happened to Mann on his trip to the city in the company of his family in 1911. The traveller in the Munich cemetery, the elderly rouged fop on board the Venice-bound ship, the engagement of a truculent gondolier on the way to the Hotel des Bains on the Lido, the appearance of a fascinating Polish boy, the advent of cholera. The only difference is that man, of course, didn't stay in Venice to die. Britain was endlessly drawn to Venice. As Edward Said puts it, and I quote, as a distant place to return to, return to and in which to locate or find that immense reservoir of cultural memory contributed to by his predecessors. But the city was also reportedly the scene of a crisis in Britain's life when, during the rehearsals for the premiere of his opera, The Turn of the Screw, at the Fenice Opera House in 1952, he became obsessed with the young boy playing Miles in the opera, David Hemmings. This creates a link with the genesis and subject of Death in Venice in the novella, as Mann, Thomas Mann had been inspired to write the story partly by his own obsession with a boy in Venice when he holidayed there in 1911 with his wife. But as for Mann, the obsession with the beauty of youth was only the beginning of a work which is much more complex and searching than that might suggest. Britain's identification with Aschenbach was broader than the issue of an inappropriate, potentially humiliating and ultimately innocent attachment or obsession. It's clear in many passages of Aschenbach's self-analyzing, self-critical recitatives which run throughout the opera, none more so than this. So I am led to Venice once again, Egregio Signor von Aschenbach, the writer who has found a way to reconcile art and honors, the lofty purity of whose style has been officially recognized. There speaks the composer burnt by the sheer success and popular acclaim of the War Requiem. But I want to focus on another theme that really is at the heart of Britain's death in Venice, obviously and incontestably, death, something he had been confronting in his music for some 35 years, from the Sinfonia da Requiem through the Dunn sonnets to the War Requiem. The title of the work, Death in Venice, speaks for itself. But in Britain's case, death was far more of a real presence as he composed the work than it had been for the 35-year-old Thomas Mann, who wrote the novella as an exquisitely crafted exercise in autumnal imaginings. Britain postponed life-saving but also life-threatening heart surgery, not ultimately successful, to compose the opera, to finish it as a last gift for his lover and companion, Peter Piers. Britain's identification with Aschenbach may have been an intense one because of his own attraction to youth and because of his own creative struggles, but death 
is a recurring and insistent presence in the opera, even more so than in man's novella, as the multiple uncanny figures who unsettle Aschenbach's equilibrium, the traveller in the cemetery, the rouged and inebriated elderly fop on board ship, the gondola, the gondolier with his coffin black gondola and so on. They're all played by a single singer actor and hence unified into an almost, almost medieval personification of death who leads Aschenbach a macabre dance. Death in Venice, not just someone who dies in Venice, but death as a person in Venice, which is something man clearly meant in the title, but which I think Britain really reinforces with the way that he writes the piece. The climax is reached in Aschenbach's dream in Act Two, where the baritone appearing in this case as Dionysius and a countertenor embodying the figure of Apollo struggle for possession of the protagonist. Dionysius, with all his crucial epithets, the androgynous, the hidden, the liberator, but also the divine communicant between the living and the dead. Before Aschenbach's final entrance in the last scene of the opera, which ends with his death, slumped on the beach, the hotel manager, as played by the baritone, prepares for the departure of the guests with his assistant, the hotel porter. In one of the most chilling and uncanny moments in the whole opera, in response to the porter's query about Aschenbach, the manager replies, unaccompanied, be silent, who comes and goes is my affair. Suddenly, the gulf between the timeless mythology of the dream, the dance of Dionysius, and the 20th century materiality of Venice's Grand Hotel des Bains closes. And in a startling moment of epiphanic force, we see the hotel manager in all his everyday banality, pomposity, and unctuousness as the personification of death himself. That moment is only amplified some bars later. A series of portentous remarks to Aschenbach himself carefully tread the boundary between the real hotel world and the metaphorical world of death. Signore, it is the time of departures. Our work is nearly done. But then the manager removes his mask, singing these words. No doubt the Signore will be leaving us soon. We must all lose what we think to enjoy the most. He sings them to an easily recalled theme which has recurred throughout the opera and which was first introduced by the traveller in the cemetery at the beginning of the opera with the words, no boundaries hold you. The quasi-realistic, psychologistic surface of the opera slides away to reveal the abyss beneath. There's something extraordinarily moving and in the end supremely real about this elision of the quotidian and the eschatological, something which those who have lived on the boundary between life and death can report on. There's a big difference between the thrust of man's story and of Britain's opera, despite Britain's typical faithfulness to so much of the original material, as compared to the, the waywardness of the Visconti film of Death in Venice, which appeared at much the same time as the opera, or the precision with which Britain himself tracks Henry James and Herman Melville in his operas of their stories, Billy Budd and The Turn of the Screw. But Britain necessarily has to remove man's ironic narratological frame, the voice of the narrator, which man in his story manipulates in such a complex way. The opera has no place for an ironizing narrator. Instead, Britain presents us with a mind on stage, a mind unveiled in Aschenbach's recitative soliloquies, a mind which we watch unraveling in the face of those Freudian twins, desire and death. Death in Venice falls into a two-act structure. 
something Britain was very insistent upon as he worked on the piece with his librettist, Nefanri Piper. She, at one point, she suggested maybe three acts would work better. He said, no, we, we have to stick to two acts. These two acts pivot around an ominous sound, low in the orchestra, horns and double bass, on a sustained B and a D. This accompanies and is held for a very long pause after Aschenbach's lonely and tortured declaration of love for Taggio. It's deeply reminiscent of the double bass drone which starts Tchaikovsky's sixth pathetique symphony, and the pitches are the same, B and D. The same drone commences the second act of the opera, which leads Aschenbach towards his inevitable demise. Britain had already quoted the pathétique in the last movement of an earlier piece, his orchestral song cycle of 1958, The Nocturne. The pathétique is notoriously a work drenched in presentiments of death, as well as homosexual longing, the first performance led by the composer only nine days before his demise. And like Aschenbach, Tchaikovsky's death was almost certainly the result of a cholera infection. There are two ways of ending this lecture with some music, and I'm unsure as to which to choose. Both are examples of the way in which music can calmly look death in the face and reach a sort of accommodation, both written by a man facing death and for whom death had been a major theme through all of his compositional life. I could have chosen the bells from the last movement of Britain's last string quartet, his third, and the last major piece he completed before his death. That last movement is entitled La Serenissima, and Britain wrote it in Venice. It opens with a recitative which contains five quotations from the opera Death in Venice, and it ends with a passacaglia based on a theme from the opera. The bell-like sounds of the cello in that concluding section hark back to those bells of John Donne's. A farewell to life. Could I have a picture, please? They are the bells of Venice, the bells Britain is listening to in this photograph from his last trip to the city in November 1975. Very sick, wheelchair-bound, here leaning out of the window of the Danieli Hotel, a hotel housed in the Palazzo Dandolo, where more than three centuries earlier, Monteverdi's Combattimento, which I discussed in my first lecture, had had its first performance. But I'll end with Death in Venice itself, written a couple of years earlier. Aschenbach is dead or dying in a deck chair on a Venetian Lido as Taggio, a silent dance role in the opera, walks far out to sea to the haunting accompaniment of shimmering, rising and falling glockenspiel arpeggios embossed on a slow threnody from woodwinds, horns and strings. It's a moment of sublime beauty which, despite all the desperation of the preceding action, despite the smell of death and carbolic hanging in the air, seems to represent a calm vision of life continuing, the young succeeding the old.
welcome to the live Q&A session with Ian Bostridge. Uh, I'll serve as your moderator today, uh, asking questions of Ian that come uh, from you during the, uh, that, that, that have come from you during the lecture about meditations on death. Um, there are already several of those and uh, we ask that you send more questions if his lecture has piqued your curiosity. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for these questions. Um, I think I'm, I'm uh, going to begin taking the liberty of moderator um, and ask you about mourning and death in the, in the context of the whole lecture you've given. Some theories of mourning would say that mourning requires something like substitution. After initially resisting the fact of death, mourners gradually accept loss by reliving aspects of the deceased. So they mentally reconstruct what animated their love or you know, sort of the libido of love while the deceased was living. So in some sense, the beloved becomes more alive after death than ever before, even though these recollections are, are of course always uh, reminders of what was lost. So I guess question number one would be, do musical works and performances not just help heal the loss of death, but reconcile listeners to death by making the dead still alive? Um, yes, I mean, a lot of the music that's played in the context of mourning is, is music that I think that people associate with a particular individual. Um, and I don't know, we, we know of all the, I mean, obviously classical music isn't probably not the most played music at most uh, funerals in, in, in Europe or America, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of individual funerals, people will play things that remind them of somebody because, because music is the soundtrack of our lives. So, you know, the pop song that we listen to when we fell in love with somebody becomes deeply implicated with our sense of that person's identity but i suppose classical music has a has a because it's more discursive and has a broader canvas on which it it works it 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 serves a bigger function and you notice that when classical music comes to the fore in our cultures sort of un, not exactly unexpectedly but you know we're we're endlessly bemoaning the loss of the place for classical music but i think it's still the case that when something terrible happens People, I don't know. I remember when when nine eleven happened. People wanted they wanted what we call classical music. They wanted something mm. like that had that degree of. I mean, it it's not just solemnity. It's it's this it's this working through. I think um, it, it's 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 not it's not present and graspable in, necessarily in quite the same way that a, you know a three minute pop song is. So yeah. yeah. So. If, uh, if music is involved in exchanges that survivors perpetuate around the remains of the dead, pre precisely in order to make, uh, is it precisely in order to make death not so final after all? So I guess I'm trying to ask about this finality of death, which was sort of what you began with at the beginning mm. of the lecture, you know, where it sounded like it's sort of the end of meaning, it's the end of existence. Um, and it seems to me that as you went along, your talk showed that through music, the meaning of life is not so much destroyed by death, but extended. Yes, but I, I think I also connect it to this, um, this long and complex association between music and the metaphysical, which goes right back to the, to the birth of what we understand by the classical music tradition in, in Western culture. To, to the to the to the Renaissance and Renaissance theories of of harmony and the connection between music and the music and the, of the spheres and then through into the Romantic period, um, I don't know the re the religious quality of of music and the way music has increasingly been given this religious function and this religious um, awe around it and I'm sort of as a historian. Um, I'm sort of suspicious about that and I want to unpick it and say but at the same time I want I, I also want to believe in it that it that this just this gestures towards something 
other somehow. But I mean, it's a it's a it's a tricky path to tread. In the same way that you know, I, I quote George Steiner at the beginning about the about the Schub, Schubert's quintet, and it's an embarrassing thing to talk about because you know, as as academics, we're so used to analysing things and unpicking them and questioning them and problematizing them. But for me, still, um, this sort of music offers some sense of of something. It's what you know when people talk in this very vague term about music being spiritual. I suppose that's what they mean. I find that very vague. That's often very vague. But um, yes, and and the, the the dilemma you sketch is precisely the historian's dilemma. You know, sort of. How to, how to how, where, where to find the line between a, a sort of celebration of the past and ex acceptance of the past beliefs and where to sort of critique them. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, so here's one. Um, whoops, it just disappeared. So I have to scoot up here. Um, your own meditations on death through Schubert, Monteverdi and Purcell are so poignant would you consider discussing death in Mahler's work in another lecture? I'd I'd love to. I mean, and I'd love to write. I mean, I'd love to write more about about Mahler. I mean, I've been singing a lot of the the Knaben Wunderhorn songs, which are about war and death, and I think that that's an interesting topic to pursue. But to, going back to the quintet, I mean, and this idea of sort of unpicking things, you know. I I I I I sense myself underneath rebelling against the idea of. Of, you know, the quintet is this, the slow movement of the quintet is this piece that's ultimate and about death. But of course, I mean, people, music can be about anything. And there's a, there's a rather wonderful sort of scurrilous passage in, um, in uh, a novel by um, J.M. Kurtzier, one of his sort of fictional, fictionalized autobiographies, where he, he presents himself as a sort of music nerd who gets his lover to make love to him while it to the sound of the Schubert quintet slow movement in order to reproduce what lovemaking was like in 1828. And you can see that Katzia is doing this precisely to sort of undermine the sort of over-spiritualization of that music. So uh, it pulls in both ways. Yes. Uh, here's another question. Have you heard distinctive notes, chords in musical pieces that speak of death? Are there commonalities between composers of that time period that reflected on death? Um, um, I'm not sure. I, 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 for me, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of not super trained in identifying chord sequences, or but I, I just think silence is the is the is the great thing. The introduction of silence. I mean, I've just noticed. I'm, I'm preparing a song. Um, to teach um, a song called um, After Him Z to a, 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 by Schubert from a, originally wrote in 1817. It's a poem by Goethe. It's set on, um, on the water and it's about trying to grasp, um, grasp life in all its richness. And in the original version in 1817, it's much simpler. And what he, the really striking thing that he does in the version he publishes in 1825 is he adds a whole bar of silence before this nervous questioning of what is life really about. And I think silence in, in this sort of music can have an enormous impact when it's really um, sort of codified in that way or notated in that way. Yes, silence is key. Um, someone wants to know um, your opinion of the best biography of Britain or could, that could be plural, I think, best biographies, um, or perhaps you'd want to say which have been most helpful to you. I think the Paul Kilday is, which is the most recent sort of big, not exactly author, it is authorised in the sense he, had, he was working with the Britain estate. It, it's the most measured and, I mean, it has this, it was it was published with a great brouhaha about this issue as, as, as to whether Britain had syphilis or not, which I think is a bit of a, a blind alley and he probably didn't. And I, I, th that's the side issue, but I think it's a balanced, it's a balanced work in the way that the Humphrey Carpenter is, I, I don't, you don't get a very strong sense with the, the original biography by Humphrey Carpenter, which came out, you know, in the, I think in the eighties, you don't get a, a, an engagement with the music in the, in the same way as you do with the Kill Day. But I have mm -hmm. to say there's a fantastic book, um, 
by John Bridcut called Britain's Children, which is about this whole vexed issue of of uh, how cre- how creepy was Benjamin Britten's engagement with children, and are we projecting back our own our own worries about this? And I think that's a very fine book because I think it really sort of um, I don't know it it sort of it sort of puts in perspective that a lot of the sort of slightly queasy stuff that's been written about Britain's mm. attitudes. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask you one other question of my own. Um, there's a kind of comical, dark approach to death in the Wilfred Owen, uh, one of the uh, several wonderful, wonderful texts. <laughs> out there we've walked quite friendly up to death. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's this kind of rough humor of the soldiers. And uh, it reminded me of certain carnival rituals in which carnival is the, the fulcrum of the liturgical year in its conjunction with Lent is ultimately a way of extinguishing life. Yeah. Um, so these carnival rituals of, uh, which are which are very rough of sacrificing pigs and wearing death masks and so on and and i just wondered if that resonates with you or what to do with that comical moment um want to call it that it it, it is it's a sort of yeah i I, it, it it's 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 comical and it's 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 slightly sinister as well i mean you find it in I mean the the hotel manager who I talk about a lot in in Death in Venice. He's a he's a definitely a sort of he's a he's a sort of comic figure and he's a very carnivalesque figure I think. Um, he's sort of contr- he's a sort of puppet master, but at the same time slightly ridiculous. So it, it's trying to put death in its place, isn't it? Really, um, and that's what these people in the First World War were trying to do because they were living with horrific deaths every day. Uh, which they were trying to overcome the, the trauma of, and I mean, I know from my own family, um, not directly because I didn't, know, I did, didn't really know any of these people. But talking to the people who knew the people who fought in the First World War, you know, they just didn't, they didn't want to talk about it after the war at all. It was just silence. Yes. Yeah. That's often true after war. Yeah. Um, so that leads me to another question. Have your own views of death over the years changed the way you approach the performance of the war requiem? Um, not, not consciously. I think what happens with, with performing pieces is that you, in between performances, you accumulate sort of aesthetic and personal and intellectual baggage, which then sort of swirls around in your head and comes out and things occur. And the, the funny thing about performance is that so many of them occur in, in the moment and you almost want to catalogue them, um, but they're gone. And it's the, rather, it's the wonderful thing about performance. And because we now have this way of, of, of as it were, immortalising performances by recording them, we forget the sort of transitory nature and the, the symbolic way in which music is transitory. I mean, I often do a song recital with my very frequent partner Julia Drake, who plays plays the piano and we we have all sorts of new ideas about the pieces in the recital which are then completely forgotten and unless we sat down and sort of spent three hours after the recital writing them down uh they're just gone and we'd rather sit and have a beer than write them down because they are just gone <laughs> but I have uh the War Requiem is I, it will be interesting to go back to the War Requiem because it's a piece I really have sung so much there's never been probably longer than a six month gap between performances of the War Requiem for me in the past 20 years. So after this pandemic, um, performing it as I hope I will be in Zurich in, um, in November will be a very different experience, partly because of the gap and partly because we've had this strange encounter with a particular version of, of death. Um, I'd love to hear you say more about that. Um, how these meditations, I suppose some of them were at least written or conceived before the pandemic. You must have been thinking con- about this book for a while. Well, this will be a book. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm sure they've changed. 
I'm sure they were affected by it, but I mean, I've tried to keep a, I mean, I also had a sort of, uh, I wouldn't say a near death experience, but I had a, I had a, I had to have, um, before the, just not long before the pandemic, about six months before the pandemic, I had open heart surgery. So I, the whole sort of, my whole attitude towards those issues, I think shifted. I was one of those, um, I mean, I think there are people who, were, who who have different attitudes to death from, from, from childhood. And I was always sort of really scared of it and thought about it a lot. And my, when I was 12, my friends used to say, oh, that's such a long, that's such a long way off. Why do you worry about that? And I was always one of these sort of nerdy children thinking about death. And I think that does feed into the way you perform music. But I think in a way, when you've had um, a closer encounter with, with it, 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 it somehow it makes it gives you some more distance in a way. This is probably a bit too personal, but. Um, well, I did read something about it online. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so I, yeah. I think I, I mean, I, 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 I do worry that in the, uh, and this is a very political, I mean, I worry in the context of this pandemic that we've become it's the whole thing of us having become very, we've, death has become very unfamiliar and it's become very, um, um, I don't know, I don't know quite know how to put this, but it's, it's, we, we live with, we, we live with death every day and I think we try and forget that and we shouldn't, we probably ought to be more aware of the fact that we do, not mm -hmm. just in a pandemic, but not in a pandemic as well. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us today for this terrific discussion about Meditations on Death by acclaimed tenor Ian Bostridge. We hope you can join us for the Berlin Family Lectures with the poet Claudia Rankine in the spring of 2022. Have a good rest of the day and see you next year. Thank you.